Here we go. Let's okay. run it. Thank you very much. You're welcome. This is a lecture on an introduction to process control. And um, so I'll give some attributions really quick to where is this information coming from? Unfortunately, this pen doesn't work. <laughs> okay. This process. This is a book that I'm getting this from. So it's process dynamics, modeling and control. And this is by um, Ogunaki and Ray. And so that's a really good reference. Um, okay. So this is an introduction to chemical process control. So um, process control is used, or I guess control, it's used in a lot of different fields. So it's not restricted to chemical processes. And actually, if you go to a lot of conferences on control, a lot of times um, there'll be a lot of mechanical engineers there, a lot of aerospace, um, electrical engineers. So control is really, um, once you start learning control, you're learning something that's kind of goes across boundaries. And so that's really cool. But differences, there are differences between how disciplines kind of apply. Um, control in the sense of like, if you have like in some disciplines, dynamics are faster, like chemical processes oftentimes tend to have a little slower dynamics. So that means you like might choose different control types. Control is also, I should just give this up front, is a design methodology. So just like a lot of times I think as an undergrad, a lot of the classes kind of have like, this is the one answer, right? There is an answer versus in control, what you're going to find is like, this controller is good for this purpose. This controller might help you in this way. This one can be helpful this way. So um, I think just knowing that up front is sometimes helpful because or else you might think like, oh, we're building to the number one controller, right? But then what we're really doing is providing a set of tools, all of them that when well understood can be used for different purposes. And then, um, so let's talk about what's a chemical process really quick, just so that it's clear what I'm talking about. So uh, a chemical process is any, any single processing unit or combination of processing units. used for the conversion of raw materials into finished products. And then we'll talk about, once I write this up here, we'll talk about what does that mean. So, um, when we talk about like, so what's a processing unit, for example, what does this even say? So a processing unit can be a thing like a distillation column, a heat exchanger, um, a reactor, things like that. And then, um, or a combination of them. So this is something that you'll see when you go to senior design, but like we combine all of them to make big things happen, mm -hmm. like to transform one product in fully into um, another product that's at a certain purity, at a certain flow rate, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera. And then, so that's sort of what this is talking about. It's saying like, whatever you want to do as a chemical engineer, uh, do these chemical processes. So you combine different units or combinations of these units to convert some set of raw materials into some set of finished products where what your raw materials are and what the finished products are kind of get specified based on the process. And then, um, so let's give a, a quick example of what that will look like. So say that you have like, here's a feed tank. So here's one that's kind of multiple units put together. You have this feed tank and it goes to some pump for the feed to send this feed on. Maybe there's some furnace to preheat the feed. And then maybe after it's preheated, it goes to some reactor. 
after it goes to this reactor, then whoop, can come to this separator where maybe it didn't fully react. Maybe it's still a little bit of, here's maybe two unreacted reactants. Here's an unreacted reactant too. I'm going to use our kefir react. Mm -hmm. uh, and then here's maybe my product. I have all these things, so here is my chemical process. This is an example. Then, um, so then goals that we have for a chemical process. Sorry, I'll wait just one second to make sure. Mm -hmm. Is it? Yeah, I, I, I'm keeping up, but just. Okay. Awesome, because I'm, I'm going to make it. Oh, okay, Sorry. okay, that makes sense. Because I, I have too little of a board. Okay. To fit all the thoughts I want to tell you. Okay, so then we have, okay, so some goals we have for a chemical process. So, like imagine we have such a chemical process, then you think like, okay, like, so what would we like it to do for us? And then, so one of them, most important, you 100% want it to be safe. So you have to have process operational safety. No explosions, no hurting people, no hurting the environment. This applies to people, so safety with respect to any, any human life, any human, like, uh, no injuries. Also the environment, you don't want to, um, like, you have to meet your environmental regulations, also just being a good steward of the environment. And then also, um, this applies to equipment as well, because, um, like, so, for example, say that you have a choice, like, oh, what temperature should I operate my um, reactor at or my furnace at? And then, so you can't just do whatever you want because, like, oh, a material has, like, whatever. If you heat this metal so high, it melts or mm -hmm. whatever. Or like, oh, it experiences other problems like creep or um, different things like that. So, um, and then the problem with equipment being in an unsafe situation is then that can quickly lead to people in the environment getting into an unsafe situation. So you have to think about all these things. And then also things like pressure, like don't put the pressure too high that it like bursts the material, stuff like this. So these are like important things about um, control. And then you need to meet your production rate specification. So um, oftentimes you will have to make a certain amount per time because um, so I guess this is like a production rate because there's like a demand that you're looking to meet. So that's important. Then, um, third is you have to meet your quality specifications. So, um, there might be things like I need it. Like I can't sell this unless it's such and such purity. So, um, you have to be sure you're meeting all your, um, all your specs. Essentially, what you want for your chemical process, you want to build a process that is safe to operate, makes the amount of material you need at the purity and whatever other quality you can think of that you need. That makes sense. That's like, that's what I would want to do if I'm making chemicals. So then, um, but, so a chemical process is not a stagnant thing. So, um, this goes back to what we were just starting to mention earlier, like, even though in undergrad we always say, like, if the process is operated at steady state, like what is the amount of reactant that I need or what is this, what is that? We always talk about steady state, but um, but as we know, if we change the conditions slightly, like the process is going to respond. Like mm -hmm. if we have a cooling jacket and then we change the temperature of the cooling water, the process will respond. And so, um, but it, it's not gonna do it suddenly. Like imagine that you change the temperature of your cooling jacket in a reactor mm -hmm. and then it's not going to be like oh suddenly mm -hmm. the um, material in the reactor is at a new steady state mm -hmm. it has to take some time to go there and so that's what we call dynamics um, and so that's like basically the process behavior in response to changes and so the steady state is no change with time but dynamics will account for the fact that um, as soon as you are off steady state, there is some time dependent until you return to um, a steady state, if you ever do. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, I have everything up there. I'm just... Okay. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. So then, um, because things change with time in a chemical process, that means that um, you probably have to sort of measure them in time. Mm -hmm. Because or else we don't know what it's doing, because it's not necessarily staying at one value. So um, we want to measure over time and see what's going on with respect to the safety, production rate, product quality. So if we're not on target, we have to go back to our target. And um, so what we have to do is we have to monitor certain variables. And we're going to choose those because we can't monitor everything clearly. Like if you try to imagine monitoring every single possible thing at a chemical plant, that's crazy. Mm -hmm. So you have to monitor certain uh, variables that indicate to us how we're doing with respect to those objectives. So we would choose certain key things where we're like, if I knew the value of this, I would be sure I'm okay based mm -hmm. on what I expect. So like, if we were going back to that example about don't make your temperature of your tubes too high, if that was like a safety objective, like, oh my goodness, it's possible that the temperature of these tubes could get too high mm -hmm. or whatever. Then you would say like, well, then I better measure the temperature somewhere. Mm -hmm. And you would choose that so that you would, um, so like, okay, well, I know that, like, based on my expectation as an engineer, so this does involve an aspect of engineering mm -hmm. judgment, engineering design, you'd say, like, based on my expectations as an engineer, it is not possible that um, if, if I measure the temperature here and it's always below, that I would I would not expect anywhere else that it's above that temperature or something like that. Like, you would be very careful in what you select to try to make sure that are very indicative of it to you. And if there were ones where you're like, well, I'm not sure. If I check this one, then it still could be possible that the other one might be out of bounds. Then you would be like, okay, well, maybe I measure both. And then... So um, so these, you monitor certain variables that indicate to us how we're doing with respect to our objectives. Okay, how we're doing with respect to our operating objectives. And then, um, the other thing is that you want to, um, if you see I'm not doing what I wanted it to do, like, oh, my temperature is getting a little higher than I'd like, mm -hmm. then you have to do something about it. And then so you want to be able to change something if you're not on target in a way that puts you back on target. So this involves both the aspect of what am I going to change and how am I going to change it to achieve that. And so that's why control systems are so cool. So they handle this. So if you're like, how would I do this? Your control system is the automated way of taking care of all your life's problems. So then um, uh, moving on to this. So, um, there's terms that we use in control to help us distinguish between the different process variables. Because as we just said, there's a lot of process variables. Some you're going to monitor, some you're not going to monitor. Some things you're going to adjust, some things you could adjust, but you decide not to, etc. So there has to be some like terms that we use to sort of describe the structure of our system with respect to our ability to make an impact on it with respect to control. Because two people could even, you could take the exact same system mm -hmm. and you could instrument it differently. Like you could have one person had one system and they said, oh, this is the variable I'm going to measure and this is the one I'm going to control. One person had the exact same system and said, no, no, I'm going to control this one and and like uh, measure this one. And then so that's why we have these different terminologies is because this is very, um, this gets to the aspect of it's like control system design dependent as opposed to being like, it's not a matter of the actual physical process said, oh, you have to only measure me. It's like um, you had the choice. And so that's why we have these different things. So we'll start making some of that more clear. So let's talk about an example that you have seen in kinetics class. Mm -hmm. Here is a lovely CSTR. And here is some inlet flow. And here is some outlet flow. We have some reaction in this CSTR where A is going to be. This is just a very, very uh, simple example where we're minimizing the number of things we must worry about. Here is something that's heating my reactor. There is some flow going through here at a flow rate Q. It comes in at this temperature Tj0. 
basically in the modeling we're going to assume that it's at TJ once it kind of hits here. Mm -hmm. And then so it's like the temperature of an, um, in contact with the CSTR is TJ and it exits at TJ. Then um, uh, we also have in the slow rate coming in, there's a flow rate, there's an initial temperature, and then there's an initial concentration of our reactant. The reactant reacts to B, so then uh, when it's coming out, it didn't necessarily all react because I don't know what the residence time was, so we don't know if everything had time to react. But then, so you expect there's some unreacted reactant, there's some B, and then uh, there's some new temperature because I was heating it, but then let's just say the flow rate remained constant. So this is clearly involving lots of assumptions, things along the lines of constant uh, volume, etc. Uh, and then, so, um, okay. So now we'll get we'll start getting some like okay the intuition on process dynamics. So if Tj zero is ten degrees, uh, imagine that this is what happens. Mm -hmm. Then say something happens upstream. Oh, at some time, Tj zero becomes twenty degrees. Okay, you can think. Yeah, I expect like the outlet temperature here is going to change. Mm -hmm. So that's already like the basic intuition on dynamics. And then so. Um, but it's not going to go immediately to like, it's not going to be like, oh, I changed TJ zero. So as soon as it changed, because like this is almost like, the way we're talking about this here is almost like TJ zero changed almost mm -hmm. instantaneously, right? So you can sort of plot that on a plot. So say this is time here, and this is TJ zero, and this is, say it was like 20 degrees C, and this is 10 degrees C. Um, say that it was just possible, or that at least we can model it like this, given that maybe the time it takes to make the changes like negligible compared to the time scale that we're working on. Mm -hmm. So we're going to model it like as if, oh, here we were, suddenly it was 20 degrees. Mm -hmm. And then so you have to think like then, okay, well, how did the temperature in this tank probably respond? Did it also like, oh, the temperature in the tank was one temperature, suddenly it was another. So probably not, because probably it has like, Maybe in this case we say, you know, probably the process dynamics are a little slower than that. Probably wasn't instantaneous on mm -hmm. our time scale. So then if you wanted to think about like, well, what might that look like? Uh, might have to move it a little bit. So then you could say like, okay, well, say that it was like here was some time. Oh, also I should note, um, if you change the temperature, all of the uh, variables in this case are coupled. Mm -hmm. Because say that we assume there's an Arrhenius rate dependent uh in the rate law mm -hmm. of the temperature. And we'll get to that. We'll have some modeling in just mm -hmm. a minute. But then that means that the temperature change is going to affect C B mm -hmm. because it will change the rate at which B is getting produced. So therefore, um, changes in temperature like are not um, restricted to like if I change this, which is changing the temperature, which is changing C B. Mm -hmm. So especially in that case, you don't expect even if the temperature changed really quickly, you're probably not going to immediately change the concentration of C B because mm -hmm. that also takes some time. So say that it was something like this is just sort of a made up like response here, but like you would think along the lines of that, like, okay, well maybe it was, here's my one hour when this got changed, the TJ zero. So initially I'm like, oh, I'm along some line. And then uh, here's maybe like some final value that if I, when it changes to the 20 degrees, see here's like the new steady state that will get set up, maybe mm -hmm. it's this value. But then like, okay, well either maybe I go there really fast, Maybe I go there a little slower. Mm -hmm. Ideally, I didn't want any change, right? Because yeah. if I'm operating this process, what I would like to happen is it to say like, oh man, even like my flow rate, uh, or sorry, my temperature of my uh, cooling or heating stream here, it just changed. Oh man, I didn't like, I wasn't able, I didn't know it was going to do that. And then, but I'd like it if my CV still doesn't change. Mm -hmm. And then, so that's where we talk about like control is that's called like a disturbance and you want to reject the disturbance. What does that be like? If you could make it so that there was hardly any uh, change in CV in response to this change in the TJ zero, that would be disturbance rejection from your controller. Right now we don't have a controller here. So without any controller, what's going to happen is CV is ultimately going to go to its new steady state value. If this, if the inputs or, or if, if the disturbance or whatever, if some process parameter takes a new value, that is associated with a new steady state. You have no controller. You don't do anything to reject the disturbance. Uh, your process variables are eventually going to go to whatever new steady state is associated with that um, condition. And then, so um, some things that like you think about then are like things like, okay, well, like how fast will CB respond? Um, 
like what would I do to be able to prevent that, all those kinds of things. And so these things like how fast is it going to respond, how is it going to respond, things mm -hmm. like that, those are dynamics questions. And so that kind of gives some motivation for um, what you're going to see is that in control, what I'm going to start with as we're talking about control is going to be a discussion of dynamics. Mm -hmm. And so it might seem for a while like, why aren't we talking about actual controllers? And then so, but this kind of shows why is because if you don't know how the process is going to respond, mm -hmm. and you don't know like why, and you don't know um, like how fast, you don't know any, you don't like have an appreciation for what it's going to do in the absence of control or even, um, okay, first step. If you don't know what it's going to do in the absence of control, you don't understand why the control is needed. Mm -hmm. And then if you don't understand how it's going to react in a transient fashion, so a controller isn't going to be like 100% magical, mm -hmm. even though it's pretty magical, <laughs> not 100%. So what it does is it um, is it's going to like, there's still going to be probably some time of, of response. So probably like what you would expect to really see in a real system, if you get a good controller mm -hmm. in there, is probably like some brief like it responds a little bit, your controller says, oh man, CB's not at its steady state anymore, and pushes it back. So even that is a dynamics question, because it's like, how should the controller direct my dynamics in a different way? What dynamics do I want? Mm -hmm. All those different things. So all these are dynamics questions, and so you can't do control without first understanding and appreciating dynamics. And then, um, so also, as probably getting a little bit clear from this, mm -hmm. you cannot do it without mathematical modeling mm -hmm. because or else you have no basis upon which to say like, I'm going to change this because the really cool thing about control is that it's automated. So, um, of course we could sit there and like, we could watch that process and say like, Oh, I'm watching mm -hmm. and the temperature or the whatever CB is not going to the volume. I want. I'm going to change something that in a way that based on my own experience has always gotten it back to the steady state before. That's one way to do it. But the cool thing about control is you can automate it, but then that's based on math and coding. Mm -hmm. And so controllers are basically computers, which is why they're so cool. Um, they're like this way of, and this is what always blows my mind every time, like I was mentioning earlier. Mm -hmm. I just think it's so cool that you can set up a mathematical model for a process and then say like, well, if this was true, then the process would behave like this. I would like it to behave in this other way. And so that means that if I developed a control law that did the following, mm -hmm. like mathematically I could show it would do this other thing. Mm -hmm. And then that works. Mm -hmm. oh, it works on real systems. Mm -hmm. It's just so cool that physics is like this with math. Okay. So um, here we go with the mathematical model. Um. Now we start saying, so the first thing that we talk about when we talk about dynamics is it's not clear what the dynamics are unless you have a model. If you have a model, you can start analyzing, like, how is it going to act? Because then you can start doing things like numerically integrating the differential equations under different conditions or proving things mathematically. So if we were to do that CSTR, just to make it clear, I know that you've done a lot of these in class, but to be clear about, like, where do these mathematical models come from, what might be involved, so here, say that I do a material balance. Here, I'm just going to do it on A. Uh, of course, you can do it on B as well, but it's not really going to give you a ton of new information beyond if you do it on A. And let me just describe that really quick just so that it's clear. So first, this is the material balance you might get if you assume that that process was like first order reaction and lots of things being constant and a Renan's rate law dependent. So this is like a reasonable material balance on A. If I was going to do it on B, just to make clear why I'm saying like you wouldn't get much more information mm -hmm. um, if you also add this one on B. And the reason that's important for modeling to try to discern which equations are important for you in modeling mm -hmm. or not is because um, you want to be able to like, if you're going to in control, you want to have a controller that like where you're monitoring and then adjusting things that are like going to make a difference. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to be like, oh, I have so many things I'm worried about. I have so many equations. Mm -hmm. You want to try to narrow it down because or else there's like just too much to think about because in huge chemical processes already, mm -hmm. if you look at what's important in those, there's already a ton to think mm -hmm. about. So you don't want to add things that aren't really like adding additional value. So, um, like the CB concentration might be important here if you if it's like related to your economics or things like that. So in those cases, it could become important. 
but as you can see here, like this one is is not being acted on by any input. Mm -hmm. So like if I could say, oh, I could change like the inlet concentration, but what do I have that I could directly change here? Unless I'm gonna change this flow rate, mm -hmm. then when these other things go to steady state, so if, if T goes to steady state and CA goes to steady state, mm -hmm then the CB is automatically going to have to reach its steady state because it has nowhere else to go. Because if these, if like this whole term becomes a constant, mm -hmm. then like what you're left with is just um, the rest of this expression. Yeah. So then that's what I mean when I say like, it's not really adding additional information. It's like, yes, it will take a value and that's good. And maybe you care what that value is, but you're not really able, unless we like, depending on what we control, but if we're not controlling this, this flow rate F, there's not really anything we can do about this variable. Mm -hmm. It just does it does things based on what C A and T are doing. Mm -hmm. So then like the information is really in C A and T and how do I adjust those? Mm -hmm. Because then whatever those do leads to a value of C B. So mm -hmm. that's what I mean when I say that. And then um here's some energy balance. And so again with many simplifications, here's one for the reactor. And here's like rho CPV dp dt is equal to F rho CP T0 minus F rho CP T minus delta H K0 V to the negative V over R D T A V. And then one more line here, plus U A, this is accounting for a heating jacket, G J minus T. And I'm going to erase this one on for the balance on A. I'm going to write one more balance for the temperature DJ. So this is for like your heating system over here. Or cooling. Uh, so rho J, C, P, J, V, J, T, T, J over D, T is equal to Q rho J, C, P, J, C J zero minus Q rho J C P J T J plus U A T minus T J. Mm -hmm. So those are like kind of our dynamic equations, and those show our our modeling. And so very simplified modeling, but you can see that if you concluded this was sufficient for your process then um, this at least sets a basis for you to start talking about dynamics because you can say like, well, how are things changing in time? That's the dynamic aspect of it. So then once you kind of know like, okay, what's going on in my model? Now you can start doing some of that stuff where we say, okay, what are the different variables I can talk about in terms of control? So here's some terminology. So we've got some state variables. So I know I haven't emailed you about this. So now we're going to start talking about states, input disturbances, etc. Mm -hmm. So in the case that was just presented, um, these are going to be all the dependent variables. So um, and they characterize the state of the system. So that sort of sounds a little bit like, ooh, what's the system mm -hmm. state? But it's things like P, C, A and the TJ. And so you can see these are all the things that in our model just now we're able to change in time. Mm -hmm. So they are dependent on time. So when we say it's dependent, we mean like P is a function of time, J is a function of time, they're dependent on time. T mm -hmm. is time, T is the independent variable. All mm -hmm. these others are dependent. Um, and you can see how they describe the state in the sense that they're like, they're describing the condition of the process mm -hmm. in terms of things like its um, sort of properties, mm -hmm. like temperature and stuff. Uh, kind of some type of physical conditions, I guess. I guess that's a better word. Maybe not properties, but condition. Uh, so input variables. So these are all the things that I can change if I want to. Mm -hmm. So right now we're just talking about them as, um, I'm going to distinguish in just a second between manipulated inputs and disturbances, which is essentially what all of these can be divided into. Mm -hmm. Typically you're going to see me whenever I discuss inputs, I'm like referring to the manipulated inputs. Mm -hmm. um, but this sort of sets the grounds for like, if you're doing control design, you might want to identify first, what are all my potential inputs? So like not which ones I've decided to manipulate yet, 
is like, what is it possible to directly change? And so directly change, let me just write these up for this process really quick and then I'll kind of distinguish what I mean by directly change versus the state variables and why these are not state variables. Mm -hmm. So compared to the states, so I have no power to directly change temperature. It's like when I put my pot of water on the stove, I, stove, I cannot say temperature, here's your belly. Mm -hmm. But I can change things like how high is the stove on and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the sense in which like there are inputs, which are the things you can directly change, and then there are the things which you can't. Mm -hmm. So um, you want to have inputs that affect your states, because mm -hmm. or else what's the point of manipulating them? But um, so you can see here, like I have the power to like, open and close valves to change my flow rates, like mm -hmm. this one and this one. Um, if we, this kind of saying that I can change the temperature coming in of this fluid mm -hmm. implies that I am considering that somehow whatever's going on upstream, mm -hmm. that I have some power to adjust it there and that like I can make this kind of thing happen. Mm -hmm. So there is, I mean, clearly at some point, there has to be something that like made that change. How are you going to do that? Is it with a valve? Is it like right. with something else? But, um, but you kind of set these based on your understanding of the process. Like, is there a way that I could change that? And mm -hmm. do I need to ingrain that level of detail in my modeling? Right. Like, do I need to consider this is now a state? Like, oh, because I'm changing it upstream. Or can I say, no, it's an input. I can change it. And like the way I can change it is good enough, mm -hmm. like characterizable enough that now it's in. Um, input. You kind of make those, um, just like in any other level of modeling, mm -hmm. you say like you have to make those decisions of like of that. Like, because also even with the flow rates, actually, um, like oh, even valves have dynamics. Okay, mm -hmm. so like oh, I open my valve a little bit, but maybe it doesn't open right away. It takes it some time to open. So you could even say like, well, the flow rate's not a hundred percent like a state. So it all depends yeah. on or on um, input. It depends on what level of modeling you want to mm -hmm. go to. But in this case, we're going to say like, okay, yeah, I could basically directly change my inlet temperature. I can basically directly change these two variables, mm -hmm. um, change my concentration of mm -hmm. my feed, change this. So those are ones where you have decided, like, these are things I could just go in and basically directly manipulate myself. Uh, very quick. So the thing I noted is time is not counted as one of the input variables. Yeah. You essentially assume, like, if I want this flow rate to be five, it's five. Right, right now. And then, yeah, so you're right. It's assuming, essentially, these didn't have dynamics. A controller could look at them and say, like, or what a controller does is it manipulates the input. Mm -hmm. So it says, or it, it gives values to the inputs to manipulate the mm -hmm. things. So it would say like, oh, whatever, my uh, my temperature in my thing is too high. Uh, so I would like to, because T0 is lower, mm -hmm. I'm gonna change the, assuming T0 is constant, I'm gonna change the flow rate of my inlet. Mm -hmm. um, I'm gonna increase it so that now this temperature drops a little bit because I added colder stuff. Mm -hmm. more colder stuff, things like that. And then so you kind of assume like when I change this flow rate, I can change it to whatever value I want. Mm -hmm. And that's so then, yes, you're right. So that's in the sense that it's not time dependent in that sense is that the controller can say, now you are blank, mm -hmm. you're a blank number and um, within the bounds of the input. Just, so sorry. so yeah. this is instantaneous in a lot of ways. That is the typical assumption about mm -hmm. control um, mm -hmm. a lot of times in the literature. Mm -hmm. So we can get into all kinds of further details. At this level um, of today... I'll put an asterisk. Yeah. At this level of today, we are going to assume that things like flow rates can be instantaneously changed. Mm -hmm. In real life, maybe you can't do that, and then so you have to start thinking of maybe the electrical signals you're actually sending is really what's instantaneous. Mm -hmm. And then so saying like, oh, and then the dynamics of the valve have to be taken into account. Then what the controller really computed was the signal and then if there was some dynamics that translates that signal into the flow rate out but so for but a lot of times we can sort of think about like say the dynamics of that valve though are so fast compared to the rest of your process that it looks to you instantaneous you mm -hmm. can think of even though what really got sent was the electrical signal you can think of the flow rate also changed instantaneously so that's kind of the sense in which that works okay does that make sense yeah that, that makes sense and okay. it's like the how we have to set up models by saying like functionally for our purposes it is instantaneous yeah and then, um, and because controllers are computers, just as you know, like when you calculate anything on your computer, it's mm -hmm. essentially like instantaneous. So if the controller is computing stuff, um, if it's sending like some signal to different things, mm -hmm. so like the control, what the controller is actually going to compute is not, um, it will compute some value, which will then get um, like go through whatever process it needs to, mm -hmm. to be transformed into something that physically can happen to a process. So mm -hmm. it'll get transformed from electrical um, to like, pneumatic or something like this mm -hmm. so then um so 
Yeah, so then if you, like, you can start assuming that even those af af after that signal goes, then there might be some series of things that are physically happening that become, like, essentially, for all intents and purposes, instantaneous in the mm -hmm. modeling aspect. And then so that's why you can say, like, my controller is adjusting the flow rate when what it really did was compute, like, an electrical signal or something. Mm -hmm. And then but you, for all intents and purposes, all the rest of that that happened in the middle became instantaneous. Mm -hmm. And then so you said it adjusted the flow. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Okay. Any more? Um, uh, yeah, so a lot of these sort of absorb time as like a concept because like flow rate is instantaneous, but yeah, if I'm understanding that correctly. Okay. A lot of them sort of do what? Sort of absorb time into the into the factor rather than like mm -hmm. trying to have to manipulate like flow rate. You can base some parts on time, but instantaneously it just is what it is. And then in terms of like, it can change over time. So like I might, the controller might say at this moment, it's five, next mm -hmm. moment, it's six, next moment, it's seven. Mm -hmm. But then the idea is that the controller is setting those minute by minute instead of it being like, um, think of like the example we did earlier where we said like, oh, this one thing was constant and then it suddenly changed right. and that affected this other thing to be constant and then sort of changed slightly right. more gradually. So we're saying that like the flow rate is not behaving like this one. Right. That is behaving like this one mm -hmm. when the controller says so like the controller will say like okay one hour it's like you know what it'd be really great if the flow rate became this mm -hmm. and then it just does versus and then it could it could like keep doing it it could keep saying like and then again and then again and then again right. there is still a time factor mm -hmm. that it matters what the flow rate is at any given time but it's not like this would be what happens if the controller said i would like you to go to this this value and instead of just going right there it was like eh, so if I'm so is that first part more the inputs and that lower part is that more the state states? That is that's a good way of thinking about it at this point mm -hmm. in like like a first lesson in control. Right. Yeah, you can think about it like the states are not directly manipulable right. by the controller. The controller will do something and it will um, it will only be able to affect the states through the dynamics of the process. Right. And then but it can the controller can directly compute values of the inputs and then so it can change those second by second. Okay. Okay, that makes sense. Cool. Good questions. Anything else? I'm, I'm good right now. Okay, great. Then, um, then we have, okay, then so our input variables can then turn into manipulated inputs. And disturbance inputs. And I should clarify that this is basically the way you will hear me ever use these in the future mm -hmm. is I will use inputs and manipulated inputs interchangeably most of the time. So, right. um, and then, and I'll say disturbances instead of disturbance inputs because it's it kind of confusing if I'm using input to mean manipulated input. Right. But um, for the purposes of today, the reason we're categorizing it like this is because we have to first make it clear um, that they're, because in control, when you'll hear me talk about that, mm -hmm. um, a lot of times it's because I'm like kind of simultaneously thinking through the problem in terms of like both the control design and then like using it. Mm -hmm. So, but when we're talking about like, oh, someone never learned control before, they don't know the terminology, so they haven't even learned to design the controller. Mm -hmm. So then you have to be able to categorize the things in, when we say like the input like in the sense we just did, it's kind of helping people see um, the sort of the situation a little bit in terms mm -hmm. of like, because you're not going to select every one of those input variables mm -hmm. to control probably. Um, so then, but by knowing that they all could be selected by you as the manipulated input, that solves a lot of confusion as opposed to saying like, there are like, all of these are manipulated inputs because you're not manipulating all right. of them. So it's kind of like, well, which one is the manipulated? Are they all manipulated? And then so that like kind of when I use it in the future, that's why I say that it's kind of I'm like combining almost design with use mm -hmm. when I use the word input and manipulated input like together. Mm -hmm. And then but this is the reason we do it this way is to first say like, OK, we don't even know about design of the controller. So let's first break it down and say like, how do you even think about designing the control system? Mm -hmm. You have to first say like, what do I even have power to change? Because you don't even have power to change temperature, right? right? So for sure that can't even be on your list of like what might be a manipulated input. Right. And then, but the reason that then, um, then you choose something. You mm -hmm. can't choose everything. 
a lot of times um, there's a lot of loops in the chemical process industries that are what we call single input, single output. Mm -hmm. And so if they have a single input to control one thing, then you probably won't be able to make even all your potential inputs probably aren't going to get selected even if you had multiple controllers because it's just like if it's not necessary mm -hmm. you can like be physically manipulating every single one of those mm -hmm. to get a desired effect then you wouldn't do it because that's a lot of additional instrumentation mm -hmm. computer costs um, and then so some of them will probably end up in the disturbance category mm -hmm. but it's good for you to understand what could have gone where mm -hmm. because then you have a sense of like what decision when i make the decision these are the these are manipulated versus these are going to be the disturbances. Mm -hmm. You have that like greater view of like, what have I done? <laughs> right. Is it really a good idea? Mm -hmm. Then, um, uh, okay. So in this case, say we're doing single input, single output. Um, so for single input case, maybe I choose F, mm -hmm. for example. And I say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change that. So in that case, the CB equation, uh, if you were searching for getting this very specific dB value, mm -hmm. maybe you would care. Also, it could be that sometimes you don't care about what's the value, in which case, knowing the dynamics, that would be another case. So the cases that you would maybe not care about modeling equations are like, if the equation is like dependent, like we just said, like on the other terms values, mm -hmm. like it's like, I don't have any power to really change that anyway. The only way I change that is by adjusting what values mm -hmm. those other variables go to. And if they go to their values, this one just takes one automatically. Mm -hmm. That's one case when maybe you don't care about determining the model. The other case is if you like literally don't care what value it has. Sometimes there's times when like, let's say that you had like a tank that's outside. Mm -hmm. What you want to do is regulate the level of this tank. Mm -hmm. The level really like, if you're, if you assume essentially for all intents and purposes, there's like constant heat capacity or something mm -hmm. to say that, um, but then you're like, I, I really like have almost no temperature dependence here. I don't really care like what's the temperature in this tank. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the tank has a different temperature over time, but it like literally does not impact me. Mm -hmm. And maybe um, that would be another case where you'd just be like, yes, there's a model for the temperature is changing over time, mm -hmm. but I don't even care. And mm -hmm. then you just wouldn't model it. Um, so then those could be some cases where like the modeling is important, is an important aspect of like, because, oh, also, this is one of the things. At a company, if you're like ever doing like a control design, mm -hmm. um, money is time is money. Mm -hmm. So then that's why like you wouldn't go into all these extensive modeling efforts to model things you don't care about. Mm -hmm. you, um, yeah. So then uh, okay. So say I pick like F. So then that means all those other stuff um, got moved here to the disturbances. Mm -hmm. So if any of these things changes, now this kind of starts to elucidate what we were talking about mm -hmm. earlier, where we had like for example the TJ zero, and we said like, oh no, that one changed and. Um, and now the CB changed. And then it's like, well, why was I just letting random stuff in my process change? Mm -hmm. Well, because there's certain things that have the power to change. And you choose some of them that you're actually going to adjust. And some of them you're just like, you know, I can't just like sit here and like do all of them. It's not it's not going to have the effects I want. Because sometimes like if I can achieve the effect I want with only manipulating this one, then I don't mm -hmm. really care that these other ones can change in time. And I'm just like, whatever. Yeah. Go ahead and do, do your worst. I can control you. Right. <laughs> and then, so, uh, okay. So then, last two pages of notes. So um, now there's the output. So when I say single input, single output, this, uh, now we have to say what's an output. So these will be the variables we choose to monitor, monitor or measure. Usually for a chemical process, we monitor states. Mm -hmm. So like, if you think back to what were our states, things like temperatures, concentrations, usually that's what we're going to measure. You'll see a lot. So if you look at like um, a lot of control literature, a lot of times there'll be things like, oh, the output is some function of my state. Mm -hmm. So I remember when I first started looking at that, I was like, but aren't they like the states? Like, what else would you measure? But I'm... Um, but so in chemical processes, yes, like usually we measure the literal state, but it is possible that you might want to measure some combination of them. Like if that, if the combination of them became a relevant variable to you, like say you weren't really measuring, uh, there are cases when you could imagine that happening. Like if something was a direct function of something else and you were just like, oh, if I knew these two variables, then I could calculate the other that actually helps me understand something more about the process. Then that could be a case. Um, like you measure the other one and then... Them. Okay, so then, um, so the potential ones we have here, so here's potential outputs. So that means that if we're going to measure our states, the potential ones is temperature, 
the concentration of A, and Pj, since we said those are states. Um, so now for the moment, let's pretend uh, for the moment that I also care about my product concentration. So going back to now, we would include product concentration in our model. Mm -hmm. So then I would say, okay, CB became another state, because mm -hmm. now I cared about it. CD became another output. Mm -hmm. So then in this case, if I'm really thinking about like, okay, what do I probably want to do with my process? Probably I actually care about CB, because that's my product. Right. So probably that's one that I'm going to want to um, measure and probably maybe even keep it at a specific value. Mm -hmm. So in this case, we'll say, okay, here's our controlled output. So that means when we say, so my controlled output is CB. So that means I'm trying to keep with the controller, I'm using the controller to try to keep CB at a specific value. Mm -hmm. So instead of using the controller to try to say, oh, the concentration of A has to say a certain value, I use it and I say, I'm forcing CB to a certain value. This makes more sense if you think if you learn really quickly, just like that, how our control loops designed, mm -hmm. which I'll get to in a second. But in a con in typical like control loops that um, are like the like a very typical kind that's used in industry, mm -hmm. they have what we call a set point right. for different variables. And what this means is you say this is the value I'd like that variable to take, and the controller is going to when we have single input single output, mm -hmm. we say with this one variable. I have one input that I'm going to use to try to adjust this one variable that I am trying to get to that set point. Right. And then so that's single input, single output. And then so that's why when we say controlled output, that means I'm using a control loop mm -hmm. to try to force this one specific value or one specific variable with one specific input to its specific value. Mm -hmm. so, um, and then, but we can also have measured outputs. So, um, So in this case, that would be like, maybe I like, I'm measuring for sure, I'm going to measure what I'm controlling, because mm -hmm. or else I have like no basis to control it on. But I might want to add some other things that I just monitor, but aren't controlling. So like, maybe I care about like, what's the temperature just because of more like, is it kind of like, is it an okay temperature? Is it getting too hot, like mm -hmm. for the material or things like that? Like maybe more like a monitoring stance, mm -hmm. but you don't have to necessarily like control it. Cause you don't really, maybe in this case, like I don't really care what the temperature is. I mean, as long as CB is at its set point and making the product I want at the mm -hmm. right concentration, I don't really care what the temperature is. But then, um, but I do care if it goes beyond a certain limit, in which case it's impacting my reactive material. So that's kind of the sense in like, you're not, you don't want to force it to a specific value. You don't care what's the specific value. You just want to make sure it's not going crazy. Yeah. And then, um, and then like, I really don't care at all what CA is as long as CB is getting made. So I don't even monitor it because it's like inconsequential. Right. Like, so then that's the idea with this. And so, um, so, uh, the, even though I was mentioning to you earlier that we a lot of times work on controllers that don't operate processes at steady state, mm -hmm. the whole like foundation of chemical process control starts with steady state. Industry uses steady state. So to even talk about the next level up, I think it's important to first talk about the steady state set. So this is the traditional steady state operation that I'm going to cover with you before I move on to other things, or else I think the other things won't really make sense. Mm -hmm. um, so. If we're going to talk about steady state, like I just said, there's control loops where we force one uh, specific uh, output to a specific state. So let me draw like the basic, you'll see a lot of these, there's um, block diagrams. This is like a very kind of crude block diagram, um, but I'm going to use this one to sort of try to show different parts. So this is the set point. This will make more sense once I fill in all the blocks for the measured output. This is my control system. This is my manipulated input. Here is my process. Here are some disturbances. Here is my state. And here is my measured output. Once you finish, oh, sorry, and here's the sensor. And once you finish writing all these things, and I do too, then I will kind of try to make sure it's 100% clear. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. I'll also write this term here. This is feedback 
And I'll explain how this is. Um, okay. okay, awesome. So these block diagrams help you kind of see how our signal is being sent around the kind of what's going on, like where our signal is being sent to, what's going on. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about, so first we have this process. Mm -hmm. Disturbances can impact the process because as we said, like, oh, the TJ0 is just changing over time. I don't really have control. So it's impacting my process state. So what the output of my process is like the state. If I get all the states, they have some value at any given time. Mm -hmm. um, I take some subset of those, so in a case like single input, single output, which is what we'll be discussing, then I have one state that's measured by a sensor. Mm -hmm. And then this becomes the measured output, because it just got measured. Then this is communicated to the control system. Mm -hmm. So the control system actually uses a measure of my output. And based on what the value of the output is now compared to the set point, so the controller mm -hmm. knows the set point, the controller knows the value it is like at this instant. Mm -hmm. Then it says, okay, well, based on that, it uses a mathematical, like, algorithm. Mm -hmm. And so that's part of, like, what we do is we develop, like, what kind of algorithm should the controller use? Mm -hmm. But there's some very classical ones that are used in industry, um, and we'll talk about those uh, in probably, like, a number of days. But then those ones that are used in industry, they, um, they like, have a very specific control law, like, they're called, like, proportional integral derivative. So mm -hmm. proportional integral derivative controllers is, like, this is the mathematical algorithm. Mm -hmm. They follow this equation. Mm -hmm. And then based on and that equation calculates the value of the input. Mm -hmm. So they say like the input is equal to this function of the difference between the set point and the measured output mm -hmm. is what a PID or proportional integral derivative mm -hmm. controller does. And then so then this manipulated input also impacts the process states. And so the goal of this is to say like that the controller, if it has a well, if it has a good control law, mm -hmm. it will figure out what is the difference here and then we'll compute some input that will drive the, if there's a deviation between these two values, mm -hmm. will drive the value of the process state to um, this, or this measured output to its set point value. Right. And so that's what a good controller should do. We call this feedback control because it's measuring the state after the process, after the disturbances have already impacted it. Mm -hmm. That's um, in contrast, it's been called feed forward control. Mm -hmm. um, so when we say feedback, we mean we got the measurement of the state, we used, we, um, we used it, to compute what should the, be the control action to try mm -hmm. to, um, there's like two major things mm -hmm. that we'll talk about, disturbance rejection and set point changes. Mm -hmm. So this set point can change. When the set point changes, you want the controller to compute manipulated inputs that drive the process state to the new set point. Mm -hmm. Then, or drive the measured output to the new set point. When there's a disturbance and not a set point change, you want the controller to reject the disturbance in the sense we were saying earlier, where it tries to say, oh, um, it's make, make the measured output go back mm -hmm. to its set point. So then those are the kinds of things that a controller tries to do with feedback. So because it's doing feedback, so it's getting the measurements of any states after the disturbance has already impacted it, mm -hmm. you would expect that you're not going to be able to fully, like, if you're not foreseeing the disturbance coming, then by using feedback, the disturbance has to have affected the process state in some way before you take an action against it. Mm -hmm. So you're not going to be able to achieve like a straight up flat line, like what we were saying earlier, like ideally I would just have like CB remain the same value forever right. and ever and ever. But if you don't even act until after you see CB didn't stay at its right. same value, you're not going to be able to achieve this exactly. If you have a good controller that's fast, mm -hmm. it should be able to say like once it recognizes that it's off, send mm -hmm. it back quick. So that you're ideally you would get like very small blips. So that's the idea with this. Um, okay. So let's see. Okay. So then, uh, so the controller is a computer. It can have more and more sophisticated algorithms, which is why um, you're going to have to start learning about coding as well. And we're going to talk about mm -hmm. numerical methods also, because we have to, because computer, because controllers are computers, so mm -hmm. it's not unreasonable do such a thing. Um, so the system of equations, so then w another thing that's really important in control is talking about like, um, so it's important to do the modeling and the chemical engineering to understand what it does, to do some coding and computer stuff, and then a lot of math. Math is really important to control. So um, 
because the reason that it's important is because, um, yes, we can do like predictions with numerical methods, mm -hmm. but sometimes you want to prove properties because um, imagine that like someone gives you a chemical process and says like, um, how likely do you think it is that this is going to bring whatever my measured output back to its value if there's a step change in my disturbance, kind of like what we were showing mm -hmm. where it was one and then step to another. And then you're like, well, I could simulate it. And then, or what if you could mathematically prove that, um, like, under certain conditions, it will go back and, like, in infinite time. Sometimes it's really nice to have those guarantees because mm -hmm. it gives you a better sense. And so simulations are great for looking at responses, and that's very, like, a good engineering thing to do. But mm -hmm. if you want to feel like, if you want to explore kind of the, under what conditions would the following happen mm -hmm. as a more general, like, because sometimes you might run into things where you have to do a design mm -hmm. and then if you're like okay well i know that if the following conditions are satisfied here's what should happen mm -hmm. and then so when it's not happening like that you're like okay well since i know that the following conditions sometimes the conditions as you'll see when we move further are things like if i have a sufficiently small like number like this like then um i should be able to go to the steady state like when there's like like so then, like, when that doesn't happen, and you say, like, I'm not going to the study state, you say, like, maybe that thing wasn't small enough. Mm -hmm. So you go back and you can, like, on the design side, you can start, like, having some idea of what you should adjust when things aren't working like you would expect. Mm -hmm. And then, so that's why it's um, sometimes really helpful to have those kinds of, like, theoretical mm -hmm. guarantees. It's because they tell you things that only simulation couldn't necessarily, I mean, it could, but it's, like, it's a different level if that makes sense. It's a different level of understanding. Right, of it's stronger. Process. Yeah, stronger and like characterizable and stuff. So that's why we're going to start talking about like, okay, like a system of nonlinear ODEs is what we just looked at. Mm -hmm. Now we're getting to like the, okay, that's great. You wrote a model. Let's start talking about it in general. This is also the other thing. Okay, this is also the other thing. Mm -hmm. is that the reason that that's really good is because it characterizes very generally. So you make mm -hmm. things like, if I have a nonlinear differential equation, if a nonlinear differential equation describes my system, here's what I can prove will happen with this controller. Mm -hmm. As opposed to being like, you know, there's so many not like systems you could get. So then someone gives you like, hey, I have a methanol plant. Oh, but what if it was instead, it was like whatever, an air separation process. Or what if instead if it was this? And they're like, is it described by a system of nonlinear differential equations? Mm -hmm. And do they meet the following properties? Then blank, blank holds. Like, and so like, if you prove things very generally, then the cool thing is the proofs like hold regardless. And so it can cover a ton of processes. So you don't have to sit and do like every simulation under the sun. You can be like, well, I already know what's gonna happen if your process is described by a model like this. And then so that's what we're gonna start talking about like going a little bit abstract mm -hmm. is because it actually helps you cover a lot more bases mm -hmm. than just like staying at the like, well, I'm only dealing with this one specific process here. So then um, if you talk about like nonlinear differential equations, so this is the way that we're going to denote like a general system of nonlinear differential equations. So the one that we were looking at was a system of nonlinear differential equations for mm -hmm. the CSTR. This means that the time derivative of the state is some nonlinear vector function mm -hmm of the states, inputs, and disturbances, where all these can be vectors. So this x is a vector of the states, of the state variables. u is a vector of manipulated inputs. Oh, this is a first order OD, by the way. Mm -hmm. And d is a vector of disturbances. So um, just to make it clear, like, well, how does this relate to what we were just doing? Mm -hmm. So then this would be like, okay, so say X was like CA, ABTB, ETJ, that's a vector of our states. Now, for the purpose of keeping this up here, we said we were going to control the flow rate. So U turned out to be just F. And then the disturbances was everybody else. So it was Q, TJ0, TI0, what was it, T0? I think it was just T0. And then CA0. Sorry, this is like one vector. <laughs> and then, so um, that's why we're going to start talking about, so um, have you ever learned numerical integration? 
uh, in part. Like, in I, part. I, could, could I, like, recite it from memory? Not necessarily do I recognize it a lot of the time. Okay. Sure. And so you've heard of, like, explicit Euler? Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. I, I took um, elementary analysis and, like... Oh, nice. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, um... Uh, that was actually the next thing I was probably going to write up was something about numerical methods. Because mm -hmm. the next step, I think, in, um, in like, progressing with the research is, like, once we start getting this basis for starting to understand some control, mm -hmm. then we're probably going to move to, like, okay, now make, it like, an initial simulation of a chemical process system so that we see we can do that. Because then, like, the next set of things will be, like, okay, now simulate this process and then, like, let's put controllers on it and stuff right. like that. So probably the next thing that I'll do is mm -hmm. start um, reviewing, like, the Euler and stuff mm -hmm. like that and mm -hmm. having you like review coding so that then you're able to go and do those kind of things. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, do you remember what it means to say a solution of a differential equation? Uh, yeah, to some extent. it uh, Solutions are often like dependent on the inputs, I think, or I could be wrong in that. And that's such an obvious statement. I didn't mean to have to come across that way. Oh, no, but but it's, um, it's, it's like a, essentially... An equation being answered with an equation on some levels. Okay, you're right that the solution of a differential equation is an equation. Right. That's a true point. Yeah. So it would be like a function x of t e mm -hmm. that meets the initial condition. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'd have to have one because every every uh, time you want to get an actual like not a general solution but a specific solution, you've got to have an initial condition. Right. And then it meets the differential equation. And as you as you said, um, definitely like if you have different inputs uh, or you have different disturbances, mm. uh, this this will be different because then you'll have a different right hand side that you have to satisfy. There'll be different solutions. Mm -hmm. So um, that's really good. So then uh, we'll use. Uh, like explicit Euler to be able to get that. The other thing mm. that's really important is solving for steady states because um, a lot of times we're going to want to say, okay, what's my steady state? Because then we want to be able to use the controller to say you start off steady state, which is like going to be the common problem. Like either the set point changed or the disturbance happened and you have to get back to mm -hmm. the, the new set point or back to the old steady state. And then so... Uh, Solving for what is the steady state, like what am I even trying to go to, is often important for two reasons. Mm -hmm. One of them being um, a lot of the stuff that happens in like a first control class based on like linear systems and PID control and things mm -hmm. like this is um, actually we write all of the things in deviation from the steady state. So if you don't know, um, you can write oftentimes like a general steady state, but sometimes you need to know specifically which one. Also, nonlinear systems can have multiple steady states. Mm -hmm. So then, um, Part of that is that even if you're dealing with a nonlinear system, now it becomes really important to know what steady state you're talking about. Because mm -hmm. say you have like three, maybe like one, two, three, and I say like things like, oh, um, will the will I go back to the steady state if I start here? Mm -hmm. and you're like, well, I don't know, like which one do you want to go to? Right. Like, so then, um, so all these things become important to know, like what is the steady state that I'm trying to operate at, mm -hmm. and then um, so that would be solving this of equations so it's solving this becomes a system of algebraic equations so this is a system of nonlinear algebraic equations mm -hmm. uh if this side happens to be linear you've got a system of linear algebraic equations which is awesome but probably a lot of times it'll be nonlinear especially for chemical processes mm -hmm. we've got reaction rates right. this is a system of nonlinear algebraic equations uh have you ever heard of newton's method yeah excellent where did you learn these um class? so Truthfully, I've been in college long enough where a lot of it blends together. Um, I know. Uh, so it, there's some parts physics, some parts uh, kinetics, and some parts um, uh, elementary analysis. I, okay. I, I, it's been a little scattered. It's been a little bit scattered, yeah. Okay. Just because a lot of it, especially with elementary analysis, which I took last summer, I just haven't touched on it enough like since then because like, the stuff I've been doing hasn't necessarily needed it. So yeah. it's something where it's like you remove like if I feel like I'm removed enough from it where it's like I don't remember it. Yeah, but yeah, if yeah. I saw it, I could just kind of relearn the process. Yeah, yeah. So okay, so it'll be good then if I go through it again. Yes. Um. So okay, so that's like mostly the big thing. So um, in addition, so I guess numerical methods basically um, if I was to just give you a brief overview of like what happens in numerical sort of 
methods like kind of uh, overview, mm -hmm. uh, which is hopefully what I'll put together for you guys a little bit next so that you can have something to start like working on, which is right. coding, because uh, that helps you understand control better. So um, numerical methods usually starts with something like, okay, say you have a system of linear algebraic equations. So um, that would be like the linear version of this one. Mm -hmm. There's certain methods that allow you to solve those. Actually, numerical methods is a big thing. There's tons of methods beyond what I would um, tell you about. But then like, sometimes it helps to just at least give like, oh, there's some certain categories. Here's a few of the types you can use. And it gives you a sense of like, the kinds of ways people think about the numerical methods problems, which is a lot of times things like, okay, so like when they're linear algebraic, mm -hmm. it's really nice because there's some methods that are like, okay, I, um, I can like, Gauss elimination. So mm -hmm. it's like essentially like a procedure that does certain things and then like just by division and switching rows and multiplication and stuff like that, it's able to give you back answers. Mm -hmm. Versus then there's like a set of um, iterative methods. Mm -hmm. So iterative methods are a little bit different because what they do is they like run through iterations where they make guesses of a solution right. and then they like spit back out um, and then like they'll spit out like, okay, here's the, here's the number now. So tell me, and then you say, like, okay, I'm going to check if it's close enough to the actual right. solution. And then so that's, like, a different way of thinking about problems is through this iterative method as mm -hmm. opposed to, like, a direct solution method like Gauss elimination. Mm -hmm. Then once you move on from there, then you get to, like, um, again, an iterative method for nonlinear algebraic equations, which would be something like Newton's method. Mm -hmm. um, then once you go from there, then you say, like, okay, now what about solving differential equations? So moving on from algebraic, now we're not just looking for steady states anymore. Now we're moving on and saying, like, how do I solve ODEs? And then there's like, um, usually you would go through like two different sets. So you would go through like, okay, I'm going to solve um, ODE initial um, value problems. Mm -hmm. Then there's also um, for like second order ODEs, you can start solving like boundary value problems where um, if it's like second order, you can break it into like first order. Mm -hmm. But then your initial conditions for different um, differential equations start to become like one is at one side of the boundary, one's at another side of the mm -hmm. boundary. And then... Um, and then you also have, uh, and then there's partial differential equations and mm -hmm. dealing with with those. And then so, um, and then like solutions of those in all the different cases, like, oh, say that I have a partial differential equation and the states are varying in time and space, or oh, they're varying in two spatial directions or mm -hmm. all these things. And then there's like analytic and then there's also like a lot of times not analytic, but just like numerical. And then so there's different ways of handling all those different things. And then of course there's like, I mean, it's kind of fascinating to really look at um, numerical methods things because there's just so many different ways. Like, especially if you open like a CFD book, like you'd be like, oh, wow, they have all these different ways. They like upwind and this and that and all these different things. And then, but I think like by learning one method, it's almost like computer language. Like once you learn a few methods, right. you get the sense of like, this is kind of how people solve this problem. They make variations on how to solve mm. this problem. And then they like, some of them are better than others. Like it's kind of interesting to look at the CFD books because they start saying like, well, like, you know, based on like certain factors in the way that the equations are, sometimes this method is more accurate, sometimes this method is more accurate, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But then, so once you get a sense of that, then it's like, oh, okay, well, then you can start choosing these. But um, fundamentally, if you're going to like sit there and code it yourself, then mm -hmm. sometimes like it's good to just know a few at least, you can like start having yeah. a toolbox of different stuff. So then um, that kind of is like the main stuff I had wanted to cover today, just to give you like the brief intro. Right. So I'll turn this off and then um, 